Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another hashtag Psycom September Live. This is our last one for 2021. Can you believe it? But obviously, we're closing it off with a bang. We started with a bang, carried on with a bang, now we're closing off with another bang. <laughs> my name, before I continue, for those who do not know me, my name is Ntigi Saiki, and I am the founder and CEO of Seattle Connect Digital. We are actually a digital marketing agency, but we are so focused more on science communication than anything else that we pretty much, um, you know, do digital marketing for scientists, for science companies, and so forth. Anyway, we are ending off hot. <laughs> All right, so today, um, our guest is Dr. Lerato Kosnet Rameti. I'm so excited to have her on. She's a clinician scientist, a medical doctor, and is currently a PhD candidate for immunology at UCT. I'm not gonna waste time. I'm gonna bring her in, and then we're gonna chat some psycho. Hi, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me on your platform. Thank you for agreeing. I know like things are so busy for you and with what I've seen on your on your feed, you've been through the most in the past couple of weeks. So thank yeah. you for not canceling <laughs> and still doing it. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so how are you feeling? Let's while we're waiting for people to get on, how are you feeling? Because I know this is your very first live ever. <laughs> But I think, I don't know, I'm obviously like a bit nervous, but I also think because I, as I said, as you, yeah, I've, it's been a tough few weeks for me personally. So um, I was like that this being my first life and also like doing this uh, public engagement, I was like, whew, let's see how it goes. But yeah, you, you very bubbly. So you're making it very easy for me so far. <laughs> Okay, that helps. <laughs> I'm glad like the nerves are not too much. They are too <laughs> much. It's yeah. so interesting that you're a medical doctor. You would think that since you're a medical doctor, nerves are not a thing for you because literally you engage with people all the time. Girl, no ways. The nerves are always there. <laughs> mm -hmm. They don't stop. They don't stop. Yeah. Just keep coming. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cause cool. Obviously, yeah. Because obviously, yeah, obviously, yeah. I was gonna say that obviously you kind of like you know you want to really be um, to make sure that whatever you are trying to communicate is kind of communicated thoroughly and properly. So it's like I think that's part of why the nerves are like <laughs> a thing that will endless life. <laughs> okay, don't worry, don't worry. Anyway, if people are joining in, I wanted to get started because this is one of the conversations I've been very excited to have. Um, and you'll understand why as we go along. But one of the okay. reasons is because you're a medical doctor. Um, <laughs> and we'll get into why that is so interesting for me. Um, but let's start here, all right? Um, let's talk about your career journey. You have like Oh my gosh, three different careers right now. <laughs> um, let's talk about your career journey and how you ended up, like firstly, you're a clinician scientist, you're, you're a medical doctor, you're now doing immunology. How? Explain. <laughs> so, um, I think I'll start from getting accepted into medical school. So um, after my matric, I got accepted to, to quite like a, a few medical schools, but I chose the University of Cape Town, which I think was actually part of my destiny, uh, simply because, um, so when I got to medical school, um, I really loved the content. I was always passionate about understanding health diseases and physiology, but then what was beautiful about being at UCT is that in my second year, the, um, a program was initiated at the University of Cape Town 
And actually, at the moment, it's the only university in the country that's running that program officially so far. But I think VETS is also trying to introduce it. And hopefully, we are also trying through the South African Nation Scientist Society to get all the universities to have it. And essentially, it was um, started by the late Prof. Bongani Mayosi to try to increase the number of clinician scientists in Africa. You know, the MD, PhD, programs are quite common in first world countries but not in Africa um, we have quite low numbers of clinician scientists in, 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 in Africa so that was kind of like the heart of Professor Bongani Mayosi when he started the program so yeah the program was piloted and I happened to be part of the very first few groups that started the program and in, so essentially what they do is that while you're doing your MBCHB, they give you an opportunity to kind of do an honors degree in parallel with your MBCHB to have a taste of how research is like to actually do experiments. And obviously you choose which area that you do the um, research in. And then um, <clears throat> the aim is for them to get you excited enough to come back to do a PhD. And that worked for me because I did my honors in infectious disease and immunology and I loved it. I got to publish articles during that level and I got to present at conferences and I really enjoyed it. And as a result, I completed my MBCHB and then went to do my internship and then came back and enrolled for the PhD. So currently I'm doing my third year um, in full-time PhD uh, in immunology. Uh, and and, okay. and and basically, <clears throat> it's because I'm passionate about bridging medicine and research. Um, and that is to establish transla translational medicine. Because I think you know that a lot of um, signs often, it's like stuff that a lot of people are like, okay, but then how is it going to change? our community, how is it going to be translated onto the practical side of things? So I feel that uh, bridging the two is also one of the core ways of trying to establish translational medicine so that when you do research and decide on which project to kind of like uh, take on, you are able to identify what's in the clinic and the gap and you're able to design proje projects that are relevant to that need that can also be translated clinically. You're not just finding a chemical that's rare, but then that's all that it is. You're just publish publishing about it, but it's not um, kind of translatable into like some practical, solutional um, impact to the community. Because science is about the community. It's about mm. helping the community. Right. Like you basically <laughs> answered like three questions I had in one. <laughs> but one of them was that because most of the scientists I've interviewed in SciComm September, most of them will start there. Say when I ask them about the journey of how they ended up a scientist, the first thing they'll say is, I didn't really want to be a scientist. I wanted to be a medical doctor. And then I didn't you know, get into medicine. So then I was like, okay, let's go into science. And then I ended up where I am now. But your case is you got into science, you got into medicine, but yet you still decided, no, I still want to do the research part of it, you know? But obviously you've explained why you were like, I like, the, I, I get it, I'm a medical doctor, I want to be that, but I also want to do the research. And like you said, for you, it's because you want to see the link between the two. You want to make sure that they can speak to each other properly. And also as an African, additionally, additional to that, um, when I got to medical school, one of the things I noticed with the textbooks that we used um, I mean, of course, I learned so much. The, the quality of knowledge is exceptional. However, one of the things I noticed was that a lot of the data we used was based on first world countries and the populations that are used in the data that we use to create criteria for diagnosing a lot of diseases um, were derived from populations that often sometimes I, I think are not representative of our African population. So I thought... Um, 
I also need to position myself to acquire skills that can allow me to study my own uh, community and see if um, maybe there are some differences, you know, because maybe the way in which um, values are chosen for different ethnic backgrounds are different in terms of diagnosis. But obviously, as Africans, we have to now kind of take the steps. And of course, there are already many scientists in Africa that are doing that, but we need more scientists who are going to study their own populations to see if the, the data also matches, you know, and if the criteria will remain the same. And the other thing is that <clears throat> when I was in medical school, you are, because the, the workload is so packed, you don't have the opportunity to ask, how did, how did this come around? You're kind of just told, mm -hmm. this is the symptom, this is the criteria, this is how you diagnose it, these are the patterns. So you don't have a chance to ask, how was it derived? How was the trial done? How, how, why, you know? And I feel like research allows you the space to, you know, critique those things. And I really enjoy it because I'm, I, yeah, it's very difficult for me for you to just tell me a fact and not explain how that fact came about. Um, so that's another reason why I felt the need to also bridge into research. And <clears throat> um, as you know, medicine is evidence-based. So medicine depends on science, <laughs> but also science also depends on the clinic, you know, but there's been such a high separation between the two. Often academics don't even, they, there's no, I found that there's actually no platforms where or, made, or very minimal platforms, official platforms, I must say, where clinicians and scientists sit together and academics sit together and say, hey, this is what we see in the clinics. We're just wondering, you know, maybe we can think of a project and stuff like that, which is something I'm also passionate about, trying to create more platforms, both on campus and outside campus, where people actually, well, clinicians and scientists actually come together and talk because as a scientist, you can't just, you know, just read up on the internet what's currently happening and then kind of choose what you want to research on. If you want to be more relevant to the community, you would, it would be nice to kind of sit with people that are seeing the patients in the clinic and being like, I'm noticing this trend. How can we collaborate, you know, as clinicians and scientists to, to come up with research projects that will be translational? Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, you're touching um, on a very sensitive or controversial topic, rather, and that is more the decolonization of the educational system. That's actually some, somebody commented that over there. Um, because what you're talking about is so important. I know that in America, there's this boy who was literally trending for some time because he published the book. He was also a medicine student. Um, he published a book in which he showed the different skin tones of like how things would look on a darker skin. Because every time there's like, yeah. you're, you're getting a rash on a Google, but the rash is on like Caucasian skin and you're just like, Ooh, I don't think it looks as red on mine, but is it the same thing, you know? <laughs> mm. So yeah. Exactly. That's a, actually an excellent example. I, I actually know the the young guy, I thought what he did was exceptional. And it's basically that, that certain dermatolo dermatological conditions do not look the same on certain colored people compared to certain colored people. But what we find is predominantly in the current evidence that we have, it's shown in, you know, Caucasian people. And so how are we missing um, diagnosing other colored people it's a potential yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. so now let's talk a little bit about your passion for science i know that your mom was very integral in you going in the science route and eventually becoming a medical doctor being a stem educator you know um tell us a little bit about that relationship and how a typical day in your home as a child, how was it, considering the fact that your mom was a STEM educator? Um, 
my mom my mom is a is a, a teacher an educator so um she she from from a young age because i grew up with my cousins um kind of we had set times where she gave us lessons for stuff she got us oh my gosh like a whole we have like two shelves full of books um we had quite a lot of uh books that she she got for us to make sure that we read them she even got us like I don't know if they still exist but you could literally have like like a CD and then it teaches you how to read so she doesn't always have to be there like it you you have the book in front of you and then the CD plays and it reads with you so she she kind of did all those stuff um so that's how like um educational wise in our home we we were brought up and I think she really made me enjoy reading um and she because she also taught technology and mathematics and natural science i think i just i don't know i really liked it i like i ended up just liking science i loved it and i did well in it so um yeah that was how she influenced my passion for science mm-hmm. and obviously knowing the role that your mother played do you somehow feel an obligation to also be a source of inspiration for other young people when you come across them to consider going into the the stem fields of course um if you, if you ask the people in my circle even some of my friends that are considering i am so encouraging towards um young young people um particularly black females uh because if you look at the moment there's quite limited black females in 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 the academic spaces in especially at uh, academic institutions um so i'm forever trying to recruit people to come join in uh and 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 i hope that through my work and through my some of sharing some of my experiences that i'm able to inspire people to actually take the route but obviously if you're passionate about it but also i'm definitely also um constantly putting myself out there to say i'm here to mentor as well cuz i also have amazing mentors that have made the journey so much easier because they've shared their experiences and it's helped me have kind of like a really great experience so far in 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 pursuing my my phd mm-hmm. okay now that's great so let's speak a little bit about your science communication <laughs> yes. so obviously we know you're a huge source of inspiration and you want to encourage people to go into the sciences so when you look at science communication firstly i want to know how do you define it so in simple terms science communication is basically when scientists go out into the public and um in a simplified way communicate their data right and like it's literally you explaining your project to your grandmother that's the art of science communication it's you being able to sit at a dinner table and explain um your science or science or data to your friends that is not easy <laughs> but also the heart of it is that you not only simplify the language but you are also trying to balance it with not dampening the the valid 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 validity of sorry I just have i just had a tongue twist the validity <laughs> of the I'm like what is happening with my tongue now come on don't do this to me um yeah so without the validity validity of the day yeah you get my point things we get you we are going to it it's fine it's okay i'm just so now <laughs> no, it's perfectly fine. Don't worry, you are 100% forgiven. Um, you know, obviously you said it's something that's not very really easy to do. It's very hard, especially because science has its own jargon and when you now try and take these words and simplify them into simple terms, it can get even more complex 
instead of simpler, you know? So then what have you found very challenging um, when you try to explain to people what you do and why your work is important? Like what, what are some of the challenges you've experienced in that space? It's trying to find the alternative words because one of the key things is to not use jargon, you know? So, um, and trying to come up with analogies that are still kind of accurate because sometimes you can make an analogy and it's actually not really saying what it's supposed to be saying. <laughs> so like the, the creativity part of it, you have to be creative to be able to communicate science um, but again, like I said, without kind of changing the, the, like how valid the, I'm not going to use that other word now, but how valid the, the, the data is. And I mean, just to get back on the importance of science communication, um, I think something that as scientists, we've kind of forgotten, or I don't know, from my observation so far, is like, often the community and the scientists treat science like it's for scientists but it's not science is for the community and because science shapes how people behave we do studies and then we find facts and then those facts are meant to shape how people live their lives those facts are meant to shape how people receive therapy how people are examined how people are diagnosed so science is actually for the community. So science communication is very important because um, it, it allows the community or the public to engage with science. Because as we know, for example, the accessibility to even articles is so limited, even amongst scientists sometimes, even myself sometimes, it's so hard to access an article. I mean, even some of my friends who are medical doctors would ask me, please help me get this article, you know? <laughs> so what more about someone who is, you know, not even yeah. academic, right? So through science mm -hmm. communication, which I feel like is such a key thing, which I'm, I appreciate that is growing more and more in the science field, we are able to create a platform where the community and the scientists can communicate. And in, in doing that, not only are we creating accessibility, but we are also creating confidence in uh, the community. They start to have confidence in science and the data because now they understand what you know, what this data means and how it was derived, but in simplified forms. And that's why we end up having anti-vexes <laughs> because um, <clears throat> a lot of scientists are mad at them, but I'm like, yes, I'm not saying what, what they're doing is, is, is not wrong, but I'm also saying that it's because as scientists, we also don't listen. Because science communication, I think, also opens a platform for us to listen to the community so that they also feel involved in the science that we do because at the end of the day, it's going to shape their lives. So, mm. yeah, science communication is really, I, I think, it would, I think, yeah, in the future, I'm seeing it growing and I think it's absolutely important. I think it's really relevant and I think it's going to transform the impact of science you know? <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. You know, um, last week I had a conversation with Adam Asako and she made a comment. She's currently based in the UK and she made a comment about how science is communicated in Africa. And she's from Sierra Leone and she mentioned that throughout the pandemic, for example, um, she felt like Africa did such a by trying to simplify it the best way and using the language of the people so that they can fully understand what this is about. Whereas in the West, you know, on the, on, on the news, they'll be reporting, putting graphs on and all of these different things, which just further complicated the message they were trying to put across. Would you agree that 
Africa or maybe just South Africa, if you want to just like bring it home, did a good job in communicating um, the science to the people or would you be like, mm, nah, they missed the mark? <laughs> I don't want to be too harsh, but I wouldn't say they, they were 100% at communicating it. I think that's why we're seeing some of the things we see. I, I, I do think we can, we can definitely improve. We can, we can do a lot better, definitely. <laughs> we can I really... can see you trying to be so diplomatic with that answer. <laughs> You're just like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm really trying not to be harsh, but to be honest... One of the things I noticed when I joined the academic space, <clears throat> funny enough, when we write grants to do a project, to be honest, the main thing that, that funders are interested in is how will this project change the lives of people in our country, right? And you need to know that, that community. You need to know the characteristics you need to really understand their dynamics at different levels for you to actually come up with a solution that is appropriate to them. Um, and to be honest, often what I've, I've observed and people can have different opinions is that people kind of characterize those communities using the internet as opposed to actually kind of trying by themselves to try and engage with the community and learn them and see if what they're trying to do is something that will actually, you know, work for them. So, yeah, it's a whole topic on its own, to be honest. And, and I, have a, I, have a, I have a big heart for it. I, I hope it's something that would be done better in the science community. But, um yeah, it's a whole conversation on its own. But we need to involve community in, in science and even in us de uh, de um, deriving science projects because we're doing it for them. But we also need to study and, and understand and listen to them as scientists in order for us to be relevant with um, what we're trying to, the solutions we're trying to to come up with for them mm, mm, makes sense you know what i'm gonna park it right there i'm gonna go to the comments and there's some questions that came through because i'm looking at our time and it's like we're gonna end up speaking for an hour <laughs> so let me just park it right there and i'm just gonna read some of the comments and you can respond and i know we also have a question in the question box for everybody who's watching feel free to ask your questions we're going through them now <laughs> they keep disappearing <laughs> we're going through them now and um yeah okay so we had a question here um do you still practice medicine and how has been combining practice and research so currently officially I am a full-time PhD student, but I do um, <clears throat> volunteer um, occasionally at like clinics, but specifically for infectious diseases. Um, I think it's only at the end of my PhD journey where I'll kind of fully do both. Um, but as I said at the beginning, I think it's absolutely exciting because I've practiced before, like full-time and I personally, even as a junior doctor, when I was running, like, for example, the chronic clinics had, you know, you know, when you notice stuff and you're like, hmm, notice that, you know, some of these patients, you know, the viral load kind of changes at this point. I wonder what this is, whatever. So as I said, it's nice because <clears throat> at the bedside, you're able to pick up, you know, uh, gaps that need to be filled, but you also... Um, with acquiring your skills through the PhD, I can go into the lab and do an experiment uh, because I have both the um, skills to, to do that. Makes sense. Um, next question, is public health a route one can take to bring that science into the community? 
I think it's a collaboration of everyone. Um, I think even the scientists themselves, you know, because uh, public health, we have public health specialists, right? So <clears throat> for you to communicate a specific data on a specific study, it would have to be someone who's also, who's basically has done the study or kind of really knows about the study. So I think it's just a team of both scientists, public health specialists, um, social scientists. Um, yeah. Okay. And a final question. What advice would you give to young black girls who feel science is a difficult field and it's reserved for men? Is that from a girl? Uh, no, oh, it's from a guy. Okay. Let me just say... <laughs> Um, what advice would I give to young black girls? I would say that, to be honest, uh, the atmosphere has become so friendly because there are so many, there, not many, but from my experience so far, at least we have a few black scientists that are already in the field that are willing to mentor, which is such a blessing, right? So I would encourage young black girls to enter the space and to actually um, get mentors, you know, get other older, senior, more experienced black mentors to mentor them and to walk them through the journey because that makes such a huge difference to the journey. And certain things that you may find difficult may actually not be that difficult once you have someone walking with you and guiding you through it and telling you actually i did this but i think you should rather do this instead you know mm -hmm. it should just come we are here we are ready to to offer even the the mentorship um and yeah i would love to see more young black girls joining the science field <laughs> mm -hmm. And, that, and that's one beautiful thing that I am seeing as well, that the narrative is changing, that's for sure. Um, you know, um, Dr. Tendegera was speaking in her live yesterday, well, it ended up being a recording, but there's that experiment that they always do with kids where they tell them, draw a scientist, and quite often <laughs> they just draw a white man <laughs> in, in the lab coat because that's what they see. But I'm so yeah. glad that you guys are, you know, um, and you're showing it that, no, um, a scientist has dreads and has beautiful chocolate skin and is female, you know, and is still a scientist as well. So that's really inspirational. Keep doing that work. Last question from me before we end this live, because, yeah, no, unfortunately, our time is up. I can't believe it. But <laughs> any last words of motivation and encouragement that you have for anybody out there you can decide who you want the message to be for but just any last words from your side um i think i'm gonna be very broad about it um and it's with regards to korea i know like a lot of people especially in our age group uh, are at a place where they're like oh my word how do i you know decide which specific career to go into um, how do I make the right decision and everything. But um, what I want to say to people is that um, know your passion and follow your passion. Do not, do, do not make a decision, especially career-wise, based on convenience, on what's, what's on the table. Unless if you really don't have an option, do things because of passion. Uh, because when you are passionate about something, um, it drives you and it makes the journey, even if it's extremely difficult at times. I mean, doing a PhD is, shoo, doing a PhD, <laughs> it is a lot. <laughs> How many tears have you cried while you did your PhD? A lot. It's another level. Like I'm just like, wow. I thought I was like, I got this, but I mean, I still got the PhD. But it's a lot. It's challenging in so many ways. It's so stretching. But to be honest, when you 
have the passion and you really enjoy the work because I'm really, really interested in the topic that I'm working on and I'm really enjoying it. That, that keeps you. So when you choose a career or you, you dedicate yourself to a career path, let it be out of um, passion because that allows you to be excellent, that allows you to thrive, and that allows you to actually enjoy your work. Like it's nice to actually enjoy your work. Yeah. Beautiful words. I don't think I need to say anything else after that, except thank you for joining this. This was such a great conversation. Um, I really hope I can have you back on again in the future or on another topic, but obviously it's all going to be science related somehow because this is so informative, so insightful. I'm just like, yo, wait, 30 minutes is so short. <laughs> you know, when you have so much to do. <laughs> but we'll do it again. And also thank you to everybody for watching as well and for joining in. Thank you for joining. I'm seeing all the comments. Um, will I be able to read the comments afterwards? This is my first live. I don't even know if I'll be able to. No, you won't be able to read them afterwards. Um, uh, do you want uh, me to give you like, two seconds to read all of them before I end the live? 